And again, Keto bare to forecast the fair cheeked gray eye, sisters gray from their birth. And both deathless gods and men who walk on earth call them gray eye. Pemfredo well clad, and saffron robed Enyo, and the Gorgons who dwell beyond glorious ocean in the frontier land towards night, where are the clear voiced Hesperides, Stheno and Euryale, and Medusa, who suffered a woeful fate. She was mortal, but the two were undying and grew not old. With her lay the dark haired one in a soft meadow amid spring flowers. And when Perseus cut off her head, there sprang forth great Chrysior and the horse Pegasus. Happy fucking New Year! This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby! And I am your host, Liv, here to start the year off with a bang, with a whole ass episode on the different versions and interpretations of one of the most controversial women in Greek mythology, Medusa. And let's be clear, she's controversial now. She wasn't particularly controversial then, which is, of course, part of the problem. Today's episode accompanies the bonus conversation that's also come out today on all your feeds. I spoke with author and fellow classics nerd Anwen Kaya Hayward about Medusa's influence on the internet. Twitter specifically, because here's the thing about this fascinating Gorgon. She is a lightning rod for horrible men on the internet. People, let's be honest, typically cisgendered men, love to find any and every righteous woman's tweet about Medusa and angrily comment with some varied type of nonsense. If you call Medusa a victim of sexual assault, a man will be there to point out that that's Ovid's version and he's a Roman. If you note that she was simply defending herself or that Perseus was in the wrong, you will get a man telling you she was a monster and so she had to die. Or worse, that her death was a release, that it was necessary, that it relieved some kind of chaos, that it was somehow in her best interests that she died. That one's a real mindfuck and I've gotten it a few times lately. There's a whole class of men who simply won't let anyone else take hold of Medusa, will simply not allow her to be reimagined as an icon of strength and feminism. It can't be permitted, it seems. No, Greek mythology can't be reinterpreted under a modern lens that's simply unimaginable. A woman can't possibly post about Medusa being a survivor of sexual assault, a symbol of badassery in the face of it. Nope, a man will come find you and tell you about Ovid as if you don't already know. At this point in my time, as a woman with a small platform on Twitter, I feel I've already seen it all. But here's the thing about Medusa. She's ancient as fuck. Interpretations of her vary quite a bit across over a thousand years, because, you know, it was a thousand or so years, so things changed a bit. That's the thing about mythology. It's not as though this was one generation of people who had these beliefs. We're talking hundreds or thousands of years of people who believed in the mythology and whose beliefs expanded and evolved as they evolved as people. Not to mention the regional distinctions that came along with the ancient Greek world not being, well, Greek. There were city-states across much of the Mediterranean, depending on the time period you're looking at, and everyone believed something different than the other. So something a certain group of Greeks believed, say, at the time of Hesiod, isn't necessarily the same as what they believed at, say, the height of Greek tragedy. Often they've got the same characters and concepts, but the way they believed those things has changed immensely. Let alone, again, regional. Because Greece was not a thing, these were just Hellenic city-states who shared certain aspects of their culture but otherwise differed greatly. If you've listened to my episode on Medusa, then you've heard Ovid's version. That came from Roman times, so hundreds of years after she was fully established as a character in mythology, if not over a thousand years. That version is visceral and explicit. We're told that Medusa was stunningly beautiful, that she was raped by Poseidon in Athena's temple, and punished by the goddess for it. Her hair turned into snakes. She became monstrous. But that isn't always the story. 
This is episode 107, Sister, Survivor, Savior, the Gorgon Medusa. We first hear of Medusa in any kind of detail in Hesiod, the passage I read at the top of this episode. Hesiod is one of the oldest writers we have, have, that's the key. When it comes to mythology of ancient Greece, he and Homer are basically it for the very, very old stories of mythology. That said, that statement lumps in the Homeric hymns with these two, given their authorship is unclear and they're from around the same time period. So this is our oldest textual introduction to the Gorgon we all know and love. Keto bare to Forcus the Gorgons, Theno, Euryale, and Medusa, who suffered a woeful fate. So, according to Hesiod's brief telling of her story, Medusa was a Gorgon born to Keto and Forcus. Now, here we don't know what a Gorgon is exactly. Keto is a sea monster goddess, and Forcus is a primordial sea god. So, basically, we know they're three sisters born to these gods. We know that Medusa had sex with Poseidon, and we know Perseus killed her and from her death were born their children. That is the oldest version of her story that we have. That's it. That's the whole of it. And again, it's not the original myth. There is no such thing. It is simply the oldest extant version, the oldest one we can look back on now. Homer, the other oldest source we have, doesn't mention her by name and doesn't explain the number of Gorgons that there are. Homer, in the Iliad, references a Gorgon. According to Homer, Athena's aegis, her shield, or other form of protection, depending what you read, had a terrible Gorgon on it. From Homer, we know a Gorgon head was terrible, terrifying in some way, though the monstrosity of it isn't clear. And we know the Gorgon was a she. It's Hesiod who gives us any kind of story. He tells us of the three daughters of Forcus and Keto, Stheno, Euryale, and Medusa. It's Hesiod who says that Medusa was the only one of these three who was mortal. He doesn't explain why, though it seems ripe for interpretation why only one of three sisters, all of whom are daughters of two deities, would be mortal. Just to allow Perseus to kill her? It's also Hesiod who first explains that Poseidon had sex with Medusa, That's who he's referring to when it says the dark-haired one. The term used in most translations I've found is lay with. This seems to be a literal translation of the ancient Greek, and the word translated does explicitly mean lay with as in they had sex, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything was explicitly non-consensual. That said, I have to wonder how much consent could have been understood when Hesiod was writing. Would he have said if it were meant to be non-consensual? It certainly didn't matter to them whether or not it was consensual. Women didn't often get to decide, and even less so when it came to the gods. It's often easier to interpret in myth when a kidnapping is involved, because the implication that it's non-consensual in those cases is obvious. But what of when a woman wasn't actually taken away? So while it isn't explicit whatsoever, I personally think it's not out of the realm of possibility to suggest that the idea of a problematic encounter with Poseidon existed in her mythology, all the way at the earliest sources, with Hesiod's first mention. Through Hesiod's Theogony, we first hear of Medusa, but Hesiod doesn't say much about what she looked like, what made her monstrous, if she was monstrous at all. And of course, her monstrosity is the general crux of the way her story is interpreted now, and certainly the crux of the standard argument against viewing her favorably, viewing her as a woman who didn't deserve to be killed by Perseus. It's much harder to think Perseus went in and killed a random human female rather than a monstrous gorgon of epic proportions. And I should say that she as a woman is very clear. She may have been monstrous, we'll get there, but she was definitely a woman, even in her monstrosity. So many monsters in Greek mythology are referred to by she, her pronouns, but they're not all described as women. To me, that's quite the distinction. I mean, ships also have she, her pronouns assigned to them, but they're certainly not described as women. From a similar time period, we also have a reference to the Gorgon in the Shield of Heracles, which is a work ascribed to Hesiod, though that authorship is questioned. Either way, it's old. The Shield of Hesiod provides a slightly different take, and some varied details. 
It describes the moments after Perseus has beheaded the Gorgon, not naming her as Medusa, just the Gorgon. Her terrible monster head is stored safely in a bag, and he, and he flees her home with the two Gorgon sisters chasing after him in their rage. Here we have a description of monstrosity, though it's not specific what makes them monstrous. But interestingly, we also don't have the name Medusa, just Gorgons. Flashing forward a few hundred years, we get to Pindar, who sort of straddled archaic and classical Greece in terms of time periods. 200 or so years after Hesiod, and who knows how many years after Homer, because who on earth can agree that he lived if he and did live at all? Pindar is a poet I don't often mention as a source, primarily because while he was prolific and important, his works aren't the easiest to take mythology from. What we have of his work is a lot of poems dedicated to those who won competitions at Olympia and Delphi, mainly. He referenced mythology, but it was pretty non-linear and, frankly, confusing. As a poet, though, he's quite something. In a poem he wrote for a man named Midas, who won a flute-playing competition at Delphi, he tells a part of Medusa's story. This is another interpretation, a later version, suggesting that understanding of her had evolved. Of course, it could also just be Pindar's version of Medusa. It's difficult to say if he was working off of a well-known tradition or making an interpretation of his own for these purposes. But then, that's the question of so, so much of what we know and don't know of the stories from Greek myth. Pindar's brief mention of Medusa adds a few details to her story. Her sisters, the other two Gorgons, from which screaming can be heard from, quote, writhing serpent heads. Of Medusa herself, we only get the description fair-cheeked. So, does Medusa here have serpent hair? Or was she different from her sisters? According to Pindar, it's very specific that the other two Gorgons have that snaky hair. But Medusa, it's unclear. Yet another example of the enigma that is Medusa when it comes to the ancient sources we have. Of course, some depictions of her do include the snakes, but there are also a number of pottery depictions of her where she looks very human, very pitiable, and undeserving of her fate by Perseus. But then, her sisters here are monstrous, so the implication certainly could be that she is too. But again, she's described as fair-cheeked, and it's notable that she's the only mortal. So who is this Medusa of Pindar? She, too, is just about as mysterious as the Medusa of Hesiod or the Gorgon of Homer. You can't pin her down. Eighty or so years later, we have my beloved tragedian Euripides weighing in on the subject of Medusa in the play Ion. I won't tell you much about the play because it's now very high on my list to cover for the show. For the purposes of this Medusa interpretation, Creusa is a woman planning to poison a young man named Ion for reasons that are too spoilery to say here. Creusa describes her poison of choice poison extracted from the snakes of the Gorgon. Once again, we don't get the name of Medusa, but we do hear that this is the Gorgon of Athena's armor, her aegis, placed there when the goddess defeated the monster. According to this detail in Euripides, the Gorgon was actually born of Earth after the war between gods and giants. Athena defeated her and presented two drops of blood to Erichthonius, one of the first kings of Athens. One drop came from the snakes. It was poison. The other from the veins of the Gorgon herself. It restored life and kept disease away. This take on her is so interesting for so many reasons. First, Euripides introduces a different origin, one where she's born of the earth itself. Then, that she has this combined ability to cause death and prevent it, a duality that we haven't seen before in the existing texts. Again, that's not to say that these concepts hadn't already been ascribed to her in the ancient world. It might have been common knowledge. But if they were, we don't know about it. <laughs> 
But we also have to remember that this is in the context of a play. It wasn't out of the ordinary to have some liberties taken when telling the stories for the stage, much like we do now with movies, TV, fiction. We can't necessarily equate this version of her with beliefs at the time, but it's an interesting development in the growth of her as a concept. Healing powers, as well as the ability to cause death. Ugh, how I love Euripides. Moving on to one of the most fascinating finds I've made in purchasing this Medusa source book I've been working off of, an ancient Greek by the name of Palaephatus. We don't know much about him, but it's believed he's from the 4th century BC and was pals with Aristotle. But what we do have is one text attributed to him on unbelievable tales, a work in which he rationalizes the myths of his time and his people. That's right. Essentially, Palaephatus explains away the myths. And don't worry, I'm already planning to order a copy of this book for future episodes. For now, how does he explain the myth of Medusa? Palaephatus provides us with a historical story behind the myth of Medusa. Now, to be clear, as far as I know, there are no further examples for this being explicitly true, but it's a fascinating way to understand how these stories became myths in general. I believe Medusa is ancient enough that it isn't really possible that this is actually where the story came from, but it sure is interesting enough for me to share it with you. According to Palaephatus, the Forcus of mythology, that is, the primordial sea god and father of Medusa, the Gorgons, the Grey-Eye, and others, was in fact a king. He was a king of the Kurnayan people, supposedly three islands in ancient Libya, that's northern Africa, beyond the Pillars of Heracles, which is the Strait of Gibraltar. That king, Palaephatus says, built a statue of Athena, a golden statue of the goddess, six feet tall. And, he says, the Kurnayan people, notably, called Athena Gorgon. He attributes this name to the way other peoples of the Mediterranean had gods and goddesses that can be kind of tenuously linked to those of Greece. Of course, this was a Greek writing this story, so to him, these gods were explicitly the same gods with different names. Historically, it's more like these people each had gods of similar values and such long-standing interactions with each other that they all became very similar and can be understood to, in some cases, represent each other. All to say, Palaephatus is saying that the Kurnayan name for Athena was Gorgon. The king Forcus there had three daughters, Stheno, Eurelia, and Medusa. <laughs> when Forcus died, his three daughters took over control of the islands. Given the geographical location in relation to Carthage, which is of course mythologically founded by Dido, it's not surprising that women would be allowed to rule these lands. But of course, it was notable to the Greeks. The three sisters shared access to the statue of Athena, this Gorgon statue, each keeping her as a personal treasure for a time. Meanwhile, Palaephatus says, Perseus was indeed in exile from Argos, but he was a bit more of a pirate than a hero. Perseus was making piratical raids around the region, and he heard of this land where three women were in charge, and where there weren't many men, and there was a lot of gold. An appealing opportunity indeed. Now, there is much more to this story by Palaephatus, more ways in which he explains away the explicit aspects of the Perseus and Medusa myth, but I hope to use this source more in the future, so I'm not going to give it away. Today, we're just concerned with interpretations of Medusa as a woman or a monster, or more often, both. Perseus arrived on the islands in search of this Gorgon statue, this solid gold statue of Athena and demanded its location from the three women who were ruling the islands. Medusa, it seems, refused to tell him where it was, though her sisters, Eurelia and Stheno, gave up the location. Thus, Perseus killed only Medusa, and stole the statue, cutting it up into pieces and affixing the golden head to the prow of his ship. So, yet another interpretation of Medusa, but here, just a woman, or not just a woman, a woman who, along with two other women, ruled a region of the Mediterranean. In itself, impressive. And once more, a version of the story where Perseus is very much in the wrong, killing the woman for no good reason, and according to Palaephatus, a straight-up pirate 
Frankly, I always agree with the idea that Perseus was in the wrong, just searching for and killing this woman for her head alone. It's gross and weird, but to have this rationalized account where she is very much the victim of him, specifically his piracy, is fascinating. It's also a reminder that while Greek mythology was widespread and it was the religion of the ancient Greeks, just as now, there were people who didn't believe it. There were atheists in ancient Greece, people who found ways to explain away the stories that had become important and widespread in their culture. That's not to say that Palifatis was definitely an atheist who didn't believe in the gods at all, but there were also certainly people who thought that the stories of monsters and heroes just didn't check out. So, in this version, Medusa is quite plainly a strong woman killed by a shitty man. The last source in today's episode, though by no means the last source on Medusa, will be Apollodorus. Or rather, the work attributed to Apollodorus. The work is called The Library of Greek Mythology, but its authorship is debated. It was originally attributed to Apollodorus, a scholar from the 2nd century BCE, but that's now quite debated, if not generally not accepted at all. So the work itself may be that old, though I've also heard it's attributed to more around the 1st or 2nd centuries AD. Regardless, you'll have seen it listed in my sources before, because it's one of the very few works we have remaining that is just a compendium of the myths that details most of them in one place. Whenever it was actually written, it's a really valuable source. And it's a very different version of Medusa. Apollodorus' take on Medusa and Perseus' hunting of her is where we get some of the most straightforward tellings of her story. Perseus goes hunting for her to bring her head to Acrisius, encounters the grey eye, steals their eye and tooth until they reveal the Hesperides' location, which reveals Medusa's location. In Apollodorus, Medusa is there with her sisters, the other two Gorgons, though here too she is the only mortal and therefore the one Perseus has been sent to kill. Here, the Gorgons are described quite specifically and quite monstrously. Heads twined with the scales of dragons, boar-like tusks, golden wings. They aren't described as ugly, but not particularly human either. In this version, Perseus sneaks up on the three Gorgons while they're sleeping, and with the help of Athena and the reflective shield, cuts off the head of Medusa. But at the end of Apollodorus' telling of this story, he has an addition to make. He adds that some say, quote, Medusa was beheaded for Athena's sake, and they say that the Gorgon was fain to match herself with the goddess even in beauty. So, another fascinating addition to the pantheon of versions of Medusa. In Apollodorus, she has monstrous qualities, snakes and tusks and wings, but she might have even rivaled Athena in beauty. Now, that probably sounds familiar, as it's very similar to Ovid's version. Now, given the work attributed to Apollodorus probably did in fact come from the 1st or 2nd centuries AD, it's not surprising that these versions would be similar. Still, that doesn't make them less valid. What it means is that the understanding of Medusa changed. It's another example of what makes her so fascinating. She is constantly evolving through the sources in a way very few other characters in mythology do. Potential beauty rivaling Athena aside, this version is very traditional. Even in this version that's so traditional, so clearly where the more mainstream understanding of Medusa comes from, she doesn't sound like that much of a threat. Perseus doesn't fight her, she isn't violent or even really scary. She's a woman with some monstrous qualities who he was sent to kill just so he could bring her head back to Acrisius. And not only that, but he kills her while she's sleeping. She doesn't even get a chance to wake up to seem scary, to try to defend herself. 
How we got to a point where men can come to me and say that Medusa deserved to die, that it was necessary, is truly so far beyond my ability to understand. There is simply nothing in these versions that suggests anything like that. Homer, Hesiod, Pindar, Euripides, Palifatus, and Apollodorus, spanning hundreds of years, all with different takes on her, both big and small differences, but none suggesting the kind of monstrous, needs-to-be-killed-for-the-safety-of-others creature that we know from pop culture. This episode has just been a taste of all the incredibly varied takes on Medusa throughout hundreds of years of ancient sources. I will dive back into more in the future. I just can't help myself and haven't covered even half of this source book that I have. But for now, this is why I love Medusa and why I will defend her always. There's no cut and dry interpretation of her. No one myth, no one woman, one monster. Each of these varied descriptions holds weight for one reason or another. Each is valid in its own way. She is a beautiful woman. She is a victim of Poseidon. She is monstrous. She is powerful. All are valid and none should be discounted. She is whatever we want her to be. And therein lies the power. Think on all these sources and versions I've just shared with you and take note of one added thing. These are all versions from before the beginning of the common era. In terms of time, these sources have spanned hundreds of years, but we're still in the BCE period. Like I mentioned, Apollodorus is tricky to sort out, and is now pretty accepted to be from the Common Era. But that only makes it more relevant because the very, very traditional understanding of Medusa in pop culture basically comes from Apollodorus. Regardless, we're still in very Greek versions of her. Dark Age versions, archaic, classical all very ancient versions of her. And again, there are more. We are not finished. Medusa is definitely one of the most enigmatic figures in Greek mythology. She is one big, fascinating question mark. Here's the overarching issue and why I don't intend to stop sharing literally everything I ever find on Medusa as a character. There's a subset of people who believe that mythology shouldn't be interpreted, shouldn't be understood through a modern lens, or it seems even across the generations which wrote about these stories in ancient times. A group of people who have this flawed idea of a so-called original myth. But there is no such thing as an original myth. It is antithetical to the very idea of mythology. Original myth simply doesn't exist. There is the oldest extant version, meaning the oldest written version that survived the test of time, that exists for us to read now. That would be Hesiod. But that doesn't make it original or more truthful than anything else. Those arguments aren't realistic. They're not in good faith. And in my experience, they're used to silence women or marginalize genders to make them feel like this character who feels empowering, feels important, feels like an emblem of strength isn't. Why, she's just a monster who deserved to die, nothing more. It's bullshit. There seems to be almost a concerted effort online to ensure Medusa cannot be used as a symbol of strength and empowerment for women, either because the oldest version of her that we have doesn't explicitly refer to her as a survivor of sexual assault, or because the version that does comes from Rome, Or, as I've seen recently, even the idea that Ovid's version should be trusted, but in a way that suggests Perseus killing her was somehow merciful, a way of releasing her. Truly, it's dark as hell. The idea that a survivor of assault needs to be released from their trauma with more trauma? It's all nonsense. It's very possible to interpret stories from a modern lens. It's possible to take hold of a character using ancient sources for what they've given us and utilize her to symbolize something. It's possible even to enjoy Ovid's version and use that one for whatever purposes one desires. Ovid's version isn't wrong. It's simply Ovid's version. (laughs) It simply isn't wrong to understand the myth through the world we live in today. But then that's basically the entirety of this podcast. So it's a hill I'm willing to die on. I don't believe it's wrong to look at these myths from thousands of years ago, the versions of which we have almost exclusively from men who believed women were property and think 
hey, maybe this isn't the whole story. Maybe it's all based on the world they lived in, but that doesn't make it the whole story. In truth, it's important to look at these stories from different lenses and look at the different versions in detail. If the ancient world isn't examined from a modern lens with a degree of credulity, then we're well and truly fucked. If we don't put at least some of our modern morals under the stories and people of the past, then how are we going to learn from it? The ancient Greeks did a hell of a lot of things that would be considered horrific and barbaric by current standards, as they should be. If we can't look back and say that slaveholding and treating women as property to be used, discarded, was bad, then what does that say about us now? Medusa was sometimes a monster, sometimes a goddess, sometimes a beautiful woman. Ultimately, though, throughout generations of the ancient world, she was a symbol of power and protection, and I am more than happy to take her on as a symbol of badass women and feminism in the 21st century. Because why the fuck not? It makes misogynists really angry, and that's satisfying as all hell. Oh, nerds, thank you all for listening to that particularly ranty end. I've been wanting to do another episode of Medusa for a long time, but the more dumbass men come at me for every single thing I deign to tweet about her, the more I realized I really needed to take a close and detailed look at her and all those versions of her that everyone likes to come back to. It's tough because what we have tends to be really fragmentary and lacking in detail, which is, of course, part of why it's so ridiculous that the argument about her comes down to all these ideas of her being explicitly a monster who deserved death. There's simply nothing in the ancient sources that suggests that's true. She is instead enigmatic and mysterious, and the perfect figure to examine in all her forms and versions. If you can believe it from the time I spoke with Anwen for the bonus episode today, and since I began writing the script for this one, I've gotten in another two scuffles with shitty dudes online who have really troubling misogynist takes on Medusa. If you're at all interested in this, what I'm talking about when I rant and rave about the Twitter bullshit, I've shared a number of those takes and the really interesting and awful ways that men try to debate stories of Medusa on Twitter. There's a link in the episode description of this podcast. And well... This isn't the end of Medusa here. Like I mentioned, I haven't even made it halfway through the source book. We haven't even gotten to Ovid's very controversial, though I don't believe it should be controversial at all, take. If you're aching for more, listen back to that episode I covered so long ago now on Medusa and Arachne. But we'll be back with her, both the woman herself and the man who killed her. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode, to however many others you've listened to. Happy 2021. What a trip. Can't believe I'm still doing this and now it's my job. I couldn't be more grateful to you all for helping me make this happen. You are all truly the best. I am Liv and Medusa was defending herself. Mm-hmm.